Okay, so today, unlike last time, uh, we're actually going to talk about variational EM. Um, and uh, along the way, we'll, we'll generally be thinking about settings in which uh, we just have partial observations. And so uh, in addition to variational EM, we'll also be thinking about the hidden state uh, conditional random fields. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see. An update here. Uh, so homework five is finally ready to go. I think we're, we'll be releasing it momentarily. And uh, we pushed back. So, so we wanted to give you a week for the assignment, but a week from now, you're on vacation. So then we just pushed the deadline all the way back to the Monday when you return. Uh, so that's December 2nd. Um, but the, the length of the homework has not changed. Like we, this is really a much shorter uh, homework assignment. Uh, we're not giving you more time because you need more time. It really is like a, a, a substantially shorter assignment than, than the previous one. So it, it really is like a one week assignment. Um, there is uh, one thing to note here. Um, there's a question that sort of asks you to do some little implementation. Initially, we weren't even gonna have you submit your code, uh, but we actually went back on that kind of at the last minute here and, 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 and are going to ask you to submit your code, it'll probably be like, what? 10 lines. 10 lines of code or something. <laughs> the whole reason that we're doing that is because uh, the, the problem was set up asking you to submit uh, outputs of your code. And if you accidentally had some tiny bug and your outputs were wrong, we wouldn't have a way of giving you partial credit. So the whole point is uh, by, by having you submit these 10 lines of code, uh, we can give partial credit to people where it's appropriate. So. Um, so anyway, there's this annoying extra step that you will submit your your ten lines of code, but uh, it's not it's not a real programming assignment in, like the uh, the other assignments we've seen. Okay, so um, uh, I want to start uh, by kind of mentioning a few variational inference results, and um, and really kind of looking at some models where var variational inference has been used. And, and sort of, I, I kind of picked uh, some of the maybe most prominent ones, but it's been used all over the place. Um, so these are just sort of some interesting examples that tie back to things that we've already seen. So uh, one of those is uh, collapsed variational Bayesian latent Dirichlet allocation. And so if we had explicit variational inference, uh, we would set it up where uh, we have an approximating Q distribution that gives us some q over uh, z, theta, and phi, all of these separate parameters. And collapsed variational inference is analogous to a collapsed Gibbs sampler, where now we only have a q distribution over the z's. So remember that in an explicit Gibbs sampler, you would resample values for the topic assignments, the topic parameters, and the topics themselves, and in a, col a collapsed Gibbs sampler, you would only resample topic assignments. That's the same thing that's going on here, except that we're approximating those different latent variables uh, with our Q distributions. OK, so here are uh, some results on two different data sets. Uh, the first data set is from uh, dailycoast.com, and the second is from uh, the, the proceedings of the conference in ERIPS, which is uh, the uh, sort of one of the largest machine learning conference uh, at present. And uh, so there's there's two kinds of plot here, plots here. Let's look at the first one, uh, the first row of plots. So the first row is showing uh, basically the log probabilities uh, of the actual words under the models as a function of the number of iterations for uh, three models. So standard explicit variational base collapsed variational Bayes, and collapsed Gibbs. And so what you can see here is that standard variational Bayes is at the very bottom. This is it. And so standard variational Bayes is underperforming uh, both of the other two. And uh, so then there's this comparison of collapsed variational Bayes and collapsed Gibbs. And what we find is actually uh, kind of interesting, which is that uh, so collapsed variational Bayes is this is the solid line, and you can see that in both cases uh, 
the solid line is uh, initially actually doing better than the Gibbs sampler as a function of the number of iterations and in terms of the log probability of the data. But then uh, as you get enough iterations, the Gibbs sampler actually outperforms the collapsed variational Bayes uh, in terms of the log likelihood of the data. Any thoughts on why this might happen? Why is it that the, you know, they're the same model that we're working with, they're the same collapsed LDA. So why are these two inference methods, uh, and pretty consistently across data sets, uh, coming out where variational Bayes is getting higher likelihood faster, but then Gibbs sampling is going out in the end. Let's look at the second row and then come back to my question. Okay, so the second row is showing histograms. And the reason that they're histograms, so they're, they're histograms over different uh, levels of log probability, right? So imagine if uh, at the end of this, this run, you took the best probability from variational Bayes and Gibbs sampling and the uh, standard variation place. Okay, so that would give you three values of log probability. And then we could do it again and get three new values. And we would change some random seed so that each time uh, we were, say, randomly initializing the parameters of variational Bayes, and we were uh, randomly initializing the sample for Gibbs, so that we were getting three different results each time. So then we would get a, we could get a whole collection of perplex uh, log probabilities for each method, and we could get a little histogram. So here you can see that the standard very the explicit variational Bayes uh, tends to have most of its results down in here, in sort of low probability, uh, and then the collapsed variational Bayes is better, but pretty consistently the Gibbs sampler is is outperforming. So this is over many random initializations of the same method. So we're seeing that consistently give sampling is beating variational base. So what approximations is the Gibbs sampler making? So uh, I was actually going to take your silence as the correct answer, which is none. <laughs> there are no approximations in the Gibbs sampler, right? It, it is exact in the limit. Eventually, if you run this thing long enough, the theory says this will give you exact samples. What approximations are we making with variational inference? Q family. There's some Q family. Okay. And so the results that we're seeing here kind of uh, match up with what we might expect out of these two inference methods. That the variational Bayes is faster, but the uh, MCMC method wins out in the end. OK, so um, what if you have lots and lots of data? Um, like so much data that when you want to make a plot about how much data you have, you have to put the number of documents on a log scale. OK? Uh, that's a lot of data. So this is uh, 10 to the 6.5 uh, documents seen. Can anyone do that for me? What, how many zeros is that? 10 to the 6.5. Is that about a, is that a million documents? Something like that? So... Um, if, if we have a million documents, um, then uh, it's worth actually thinking about 
um, uh, what method uh, you might want to use. And so uh, online variational Bayes is sort of like the stochastic gradient equivalent of gradient descent. Right? So we can take gradient descent and we can make it stochastic or online by taking one example at a time. And you can do the same thing uh, when you're training models like these. And here what we're seeing is that uh, you can take uh, an online method that uh, that is able to get much more progress much more quickly. And in fact, it's able to actually sort of beat out the batch version uh, in the end and actually get lower perplexity. Uh, so the, the contrast here uh, between batch variational bays and online variational bays is uh, essentially that uh, for, for both of these, um, we have uh, you know some outer for loop or some outer loop that's kind of deciding when to stop. And, uh, and what we're going to look at in a moment is how we can kind of break up learning into an E step and an M step for an EM algorithm. And, uh, and there's an E step and an M step for the online version. And the key difference is that in the online version, uh, we're essentially assuming that uh, we get one document, uh, t at a time, and uh, we're, we're updating based purely on that one document. Uh, whereas the batch uh, is doing a whole collection of computations for the full document collection, and then updating the parameters for that document collection. Uh, so this contrast, so you can see by contrast, so, so here on the, the right, this is a for loop over documents. For, this is like for each document. Okay. And over there, uh, we're doing computations just for that one document and then updating parameters in an M step. Okay. And so, um, uh, so, so this is all for the LDA model. So now I want to think about a, a different model which is that of a fully connected CRF. So here, I want to actually just quickly sketch a picture of what it is that I'm talking about. So a fully connected CRF is one uh, where we take a normal pairwise CRF like this one that's maybe like a grid model and then we say um, so th this by itself is just what we would call like a, a, a pairwise Grid. And a fully connected CRF is going to be one where we start to add a whole bunch of edges here. So for this node in the upper left corner, we're going to add a diagonal edge. And then we're going to add another edge over here, over there, over here. Here, here, and we're going to have edges like that for every single node in this graph. So now we go to the second node, and we connect it diagonally and across to every other node in this graph, and so on down the line. So. Uh, this fully connected CRF, um, if we were to write out sort of a, a factor graph like or a potential function version of the model, we would say, okay, we're going to have the probability of some segmentation x given some image i. So x is the output here and i is the input. 
And uh, so just here, what we're looking at is like, this is an example of an X, and this is an example of, oops, sorry, other way around. Uh, this is an example of an I, and this is an example of an X. And actually, each of these are different examples of X's from different models. So what we're saying is that the probability is going to be uh, just the usual CRF, where we have a partition function, z, that is a function of the input, zi, and then we have x of some negative energy function, where the energy function is just the uh, sum of a bunch of potentials. So usually we t we've been talking about potentials as x of some score. Here, they've already exponentiated the potentials. So now the potentials are what we usually think of as log potentials. So we can add them. And so you have, for each variable i, you have one potential function. And then for each pair of variables, uh, you also have a fu uh, potential function. And the key thing is that that second summation is for all i less than j. OK, so, um, so for inference, uh, it's actually possible to do Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, for a fully connected CRF like this, um, but it's incredibly slow. And so instead, uh, there's this paper in 2011 that introduced this, this crazy model and, and said, well, we can actually do variational inference for this. And what we can further do is we can say that we're going to filter out some of the variables from that summation over all possible pairs uh, that seem like they don't actually make a difference uh, once you get this thing running. And so, uh, so what we're looking at in the top figure here is um, basically the, the pixel level segmentation of the image into different regions like grass and tree or gra grass and dirt and bench. And so uh, the, f the first thing that we can see here is uh, that in figure 1b, uh, this is what you get. So let's focus on the bench here. So what you get when you're using just entirely independent classifiers is something really quite bad. Uh, there's all this interspersing of this, this like red color, which I forget what the label is. but. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, it's nothing that we care about. And um, so then uh, instead, uh, you could do uh, some other fancy model called a robust PN CRF. But what we're concerned with are, are D and E. So those two are the fully connected CRF with MCMC inference and the fully connected CRF with variational inference, which is what they're calling our approach. And you can see that the performance of these two is actually pretty darn close. Um, maybe the variational inference is actually slightly better. But the key difference here is that the MCMC is taking 36 hours and variational inference is taking 0.2 seconds. Okay, so uh, which would you choose? Um, and then down below, uh, they also are, are looking at something interesting here, which is just the, the actual convergence of the KL divergence between the true distribution and the Q distribution. And so they're showing as a function of the number of iterations for different hyperparameters how uh, they, it's very robust to the selection of hyperparameters in that you know, regardless of which hyperparameters they're choosing here, it kind of all converges uh, to the same point. Though uh, so maybe in early uh, phases, early numbers of iterations it matters. Um, and, uh, and then on the right, they're also showing the actual distribution according to the Q function uh, for this particular image. So, so the image is just that seagull flying through the air there. And they have a Q distribution for the probability of, it, of a pixel being bird, and then a Q distribution for the probability of a pixel being sky. Okay. So these two distributions are decoupled, right? They're not actually 
uh, jointly estimating the probability of a pixel being bird or sky. They're separately estimating the two. And so uh, then they can visualize over iterations uh, what these distributions actually look like. And this is, of course, the post this is sort of an estimate of the posterior distribution over those different classes. And you can see that over, uh, even just sort of after one iteration, uh, the Q sky distribution has really narrowed in on what is sky, and it's sort of cut out the bird as not sky. Okay, and then, but in the top, after one iteration, it's still not exactly sure what the bird is. It really takes two iterations before Q bird actually kind of comes into focus. Okay, and then by ten iterations, they're both really crisp. Yeah, so this is sort of an interesting way of uh, decomposing, um, but they're decomposing into these sort of independent distributions for each of the classes, uh, even though the true model is actually jointly giving a distribution over all the classes. So this is a sort of a different way of decomposing than anything that we've seen up until now. Um, okay, so it shouldn't be too surprising to you that, so that was maybe a 2011 paper. And then a couple years later, at iClear 2015, someone came along and said, huh, those fully connected CRS, they, they seemed like they were pretty cool, but, I mean, it was a little bit uh, hokey because they weren't using CNNs, and, you know, now everybody uses CNNs, so... Uh, maybe we should take their fully connected CRF and combine it with a deep CNN and, uh, and get back uh, something better. And, uh, and so that's exactly what this paper did, uh, and they got good results uh, with this combined model, where essentially these, uh, these potential functions were no longer coming from some sort of fixed small function, but they were coming from uh, the output of a CNN. <coughs> Okay, uh, so uh, this is actually an example of a structured mean field. Um, so we were talking mostly about models where you have um, uh, basically a mean field assumption that uh, each individual variable is independent. But here, um, we're going to think about a case where you have dynamic programming algorithms that you can use to uh, work with uh, some subsets of variables. So what we're looking at here is a joint problem of uh, alignment between an English and Chinese sentence and, uh, and then parsing of both the English sentence and the Mandarin. And so uh, here, there's some ellipses here, right? They didn't actually show the, the whole sentence, but uh, something was established, they, or they were established in such places as uh, Quan Zhao, Zhang Zhao, etc. And, and then here we have uh, the Mandarin. And what you can see is that um, we have these different blocks that are kind of aligned with each other. So here, such places as should, um, sorry, I don't speak Mandarin, but it should align uh, with this little noun that I've circled here. So those two are a translation of each other, but it's interesting because in the English, you actually need three words to capture this, and they actually span separate constituents in the syntactic representation of the sentence. Okay, so this is what we, this here is one of the constituents, and then over here, this is another constituent, and the word as falls in this right-hand side constituent, whereas such places falls in the left-hand side constituent. And so, uh, and then we have uh, a place here, or a place plus etc., and uh, that maps to uh, three words here. And uh, we're established, okay, it translates down to these two, but in actually 
lines up with this first character. Okay, so you can see what's going on is that in this translation, there's a lot of movement between these different subphrases. Okay, but if you know something about the subphrases, it might actually help you figure out how the different words align. Okay, so the goal of joint uh, parsing and alignment is to simultaneously figure out which words are aligned to each other and also generate these syntactic parses for the two sentences, these trees for the sentences. And so the trees are representing the actual grammar for the sentence where we would say, okay, this entire thing is a verb phrase um, and it consists of these two verbs. And then back here, in such places as is a prepositional phrase, and it consists of uh, this larger noun phrase, which is containing yet another prepositional phrase, right? So this is sort of a decomposition of the semantic, syntactic structure of the sentence. And so the whole idea here is that uh, there exists efficient dynamic programming algorithms uh, for doing things like parsing. Um, so one such algorithm is, say, the CKY algorithm, and it, or, or the inside-outside algorithm. And you could think of that as sort of uh, the equivalent of belief propagation for running uh, over a collection of trees. It's just another dynamic programming algorithm. And then there's also uh, dynamic programming algorithms like ITG, uh, which allow us to efficiently reason about uh, a collection uh, about uh, uh, an alignment between two sentences. And so uh, what uh, Burkett and others uh, did in 2010 is they said, well, what if we took those two dynamic programming algorithms and kind of combined them together uh, within variational inference? So that would be structured mean field variational inference, where you essentially say, OK, here's one big variable. Let's call this z sub a for alignment. And here's another big variable. Let's call this z sub t for uh, target language. And here's another big variable for z sub s that is uh, representing the source language. Okay? So all of these are latent variables, but they're big latent variables, right? This z a ranges over the space of all possible alignments. And ZS ranges over the space of all possible trees. And same with ZT. And so if you have efficient algorithms for reasoning about the space of all possible trees, uh, then you could decompose your, your, you could have your mean field approximation look like Q of Z as decomposing into Q of ZA times Q of ZS times Q of ZT. rather than having, say, a whole bunch of tiny little variables, like one here, 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 right? And having the mean field break up over each individual binary variable, saying, is this word aligned to another word? And so, uh, so what they report here are both parsing results, because they want to know how accurate are, is their parsing, and they also report word alignment results, because they want to know how accurate that is. And what they find is that um, the, uh, d depending on which language you're looking at, uh, Chinese or English, uh, either a re-ranker or their joint model actually wins. But sort of if averaged over the two, um, the joint model wins in terms of parsing results. And then uh, for the word alignment results, uh, if we look at F1, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall, uh, the joint model actually does a good bit better than sort of the competing ITG model on the HMM. If you are a moderate reader, would you prefer to have the Yeah, so we, so in fact, we do talk about each of those individual little variables. But what's going on is, um, so another way that I could interpret this 
little diagram that I just said, is let ZA be the collection of all the variables that make up that little word alignment matrix. Okay? And so if the English sentence or the source sentence has uh, N sub S tokens in it and the target sentence has N sub T tokens, then there's going to be N sub S times N sub T variables in that matrix. And so we could say ZA is actually just the set of all of those variables. So it, under that interpretation, right, what I wrote here still holds. This is still the structured mean field approximation. But now, when I write Q of ZA, I'm really talking about Q of a whole collection of variables. And that approximation, Q of ZA, doesn't decompose with a mean field approximation, or with a mean field assumption, where each, in, each variable is independent. So there's going to be some interesting dependencies between those variables, things like uh, the, like that allow us to look at like the fertility of a word. So, for example, if we go back here, um, so one thing that you'll notice is that most of the time, if you have you know one English word, it maps to say one Mandarin word, and if you have three Mandarin words, it may map to uh, three English words or two and two, right? There's only one sort of unusual case here, which is where we have three English words that map to just one Mandarin character. And, uh, and so a fertility constraint that you could impose would be that you know, most of the time, uh, or maybe a fertility prior would say most of the time, uh, the number of words that you align with is going to be uh, you know, about one for each word. And so that sort of Imposing that uh, constraint on these ZA variables would require uh, more than a mean field approximation, but uh, there's efficient algorithms that we can work with those sorts of constraints. Okay, so um, so next I want to think about hidden state CRFs, and um, so uh, the setting that I want to think about these for is actually computer vision, where we could say that we have some data consisting of images and labels. So images X and labels Y. So here's our X, here's our Y. And um, we're going to say that we're going to pre-process our data into patches. And you know uh, that's going to consist of these little rectangles. And then we're going to say that there's some latent labeling uh, so, and then the patches will represent by variables x, right? So this is this x1 represents all of the pixel data for that blue patch, and that x7 represents all the pixel data for that yellow patch. Where it is in the image, what the actual values of the pixels are, etc. Okay, and z1 we're going to posit is uh, the labeling of that patch, right? So here, uh, this should be labeled as leg, and this should be labeled as leg. Actually, all four of these should. And then Z5 over here should be labeled as tail, Z6 as torso, and Z7 as head. And uh, we're going to assume that you could go in and label these patches with sensible labels like that. But our data only consists of images with labels. It doesn't have these patch level labels. So while I believe that we could get this data, it would be expensive and time consuming. So instead, let's define a graphical model with these latent variables in mind. And then we're not going to actually observe any of those Z's at train or test time. So this is a partially observed model in a different way than, say, the latent Dirichlet allocation model that we have been looking at. Because in LDA, uh, you just observe the actual documents, and then all of the other variables and parameters are unobserved. But here, that's not the case. We actually do observe, at training time, the value of Y being leopard. So we have some signal uh, coming from that supervised label. So 
what do we do? We then add factors between uh, each x and its corresponding z, because we believe that whatever the pixels are would tell you a lot about you know, what the actual label for the patch is. right? But then we say, well, we know where positionally these patches are. So let's actually connect up the individual latent variables here based on their nearest neighbors. So I just connected them up in some arbitrary way here, but making sure that the close by z's were connected to each other. And then let's connect all of those factors to the output label y. Okay, so why would we do that? Well, because maybe we believe that if you know what the configuration of these latent variables are, if you know that there's a head, uh, four legs, and a tail, and a torso, then it's very likely that the true y label here is leopard and not bird. Because if it were a bird, we wouldn't have four leg labels, we'd have two. And we'd probably also have some wing labels. Okay, so now think about how you could actually train a model like this. You could say, my data is just the x's and the y's, and I have n examples of those. But I'm going to define a joint model over both y and z conditioned on x. So this is a CRF. But we can marginalize out the z's if we want to, right? We could say, well, there's a marginalized model, which is just the probability of y given x, which is the joint model summed over all possible values for z. So what we can do here is actually work with that marginalized model. Okay? And how do we work with it? Well, we train using gradient descent. But here, we maximize, say, the likelihood of our data d, but we do so marginalizing over the latent variables that we didn't observe z. And so if you work out uh, the, the gradient 6, and let's say that we have uh, a feature-based model rather than, say, uh, a CNN backing this, just for simplicity, then what we would get back is something that looks very similar to the standard CRF gradient, which is the difference of two expectations. Now, if this was a standard CRF, we would have the first expectation <coughs> being uh, the, uh, the, the actual empirical counts that we observed on the data. The, the, basically, the empirical counts of the feature from the actual data distribution. And then our other expectation would be the model's expectation about what the features would be, marginalizing over all the latent variables. That's almost what we have here, except instead we're seeing uh, that the marginalized variables show up in both expectations. Namely, here we have an expectation under uh, the distribution over Z's given the true value of the Y's. And then here we have a distribution over both Y and Z, where I've, I've kind of left out uh, the conditioning on X just because otherwise this thing wouldn't fit on one slide. So if we expand those expectations out, right, you can see that uh, basically the first expectation is summing over just Z for the true y, and then the second expectation is summing over both y and z. And so the key trick here is that we can get these marginal probabilities just by running some inference algorithm on the full factor graph. So the question is, how do we get these marginal Go back to the factor graph. Here's what it looks like. So we observe the x's, and then we run something like um, 
Gibbs sampling or a variational inference. And we can get back estimates for those marginal probabilities that we need to train this thing. Okay. But they're going to be, if we do it for this, they're going to be marginals of uh, P of you know, Z and Y. So how do we get marginals of just Z given Y? Oh, that's, uh, that's an interesting thought. Um, so, but th there's actually something simpler. We don't even need to, uh, don't think too hard. <laughs> yeah, we just fix y, right? If I take this factor graph and I just shade in y, right, with its actual value, right, the actual yn, for that training example, leopard. And then I run inference on the new factor graph where y is treated as observed. Then we'll just get marginal probabilities for z given y. So basically, to train this thing, you have to run inference twice, once on the full factor graph and once on what I'm calling here the clamped factor graph, which is just where we clamp the values of y to the actual values that we observe in the training data and marginalize over the values of z. Yeah, so I mean, the way that I, uh, this was sort of a made up example, but the way that I came up with this particular structure was I was saying that uh, the actual connection between uh, pairs of the z variables is given by like their adjacency. So maybe I believe that, uh, so if you imagine the patches, now let's imagine that like all of the patches are half the size that they are in this picture, right? So in that case, you know, if we just have some patches, you know, this might actually consist of three patches. So you're running seg in this segmentation first. And oh, sorry. Yeah. So patches. Yeah. So it's not exactly image segmentation. So to, there's computer vision has long had ways of taking an image and dividing it into little regions where uh, the pixels in that region are all very similar, say in color or brightness or darkness. And so if you do that, uh, you can actually get back um, a form of segmentation of the image into what, what we have. I mean, patches here is actually a technical term uh, used to mean these like collections of pixels. Sometimes they're also called super pixels. Um, and so these super pixels are, uh, are given to us by some pre-processing algorithms. And then rather than uh, labeling individual pixels one at a time, we're labeling super pixels. And so usually there's some hyperparameter on that deterministic function that gives you back super pixels that, that, that says, you know, how big do you want your super pixels to be? And so if you wanted them to be somewhat small, then you might believe that, in fact, here, uh, the uh, the individual patches that are nearby each other are more likely to share the same label. Okay, so in the extreme case, you could take the model that I'm describing here and say, what if uh, you your super pixels were all of size one pixel? Okay, so then what are you doing? You're doing exactly the semantic segmentation problem that you guys solved but you're doing it without labeled training data for the actual semantic segmentation. Right? So now we're saying all you have is image classification data, but you're jointly learning a model that can semantically segment an image at the pixel, pixel level. So um, I, I've not actually have I ever seen that done. I don't know. So you could Google whether anyone's actually tried that. Maybe no one has, but you could imagine basically taking the semantic segmentation model that you had um, and instead of doing 
uh, structured SVM training with uh, map inference, we could say replace that with variational inference, like a mean field approximation. And then we could marginalize over uh, the unobserved uh, pixel level annotations and just try to do uh, training based on classification data. Okay, so, um, so now I actually want to take sort of a small step back in order to take a bigger step forward, um, which is uh, I want to look at Gaussian mixture models because about half the class maybe has not actually seen expectation maximization before. Um, and so it's useful just to kind of uh, briefly think about uh, just kind of a, a very simple model with EM, and then we'll think about variational EM. So a Gaussian mixture model is one where uh, we assume that we just have a bunch of, we have n data points, and each data point is in m-dimensional space. And the generative story is you draw some uh, cluster label for each point. So this is going to be a clustering model. So you draw a cluster label for each point from some categorical distribution parameterized by phi. Okay, that gives you a z. And then you sample the actual point using the mean and variance for that particular cluster, z, that you just chose. So z here is like an integer, you know, 1 up to, say, k if you have k clusters. And then you would have k means and k variances for each cluster. And so... Uh, the joint model is of both x and z, but you could marginalize over the actual cluster labels. And the idea of EM is that what we want to do is actually maximize not the likelihood of the uh, x's and the z's, but of just the x's, because we don't know what the z's are. So this is a marginal likelihood optimization problem, where we want to sum over all possible k values that z could take on. Uh, and maximize the joint likelihood of both x and z. Okay, so more generally, a, a mixture model is one where you have data and you have some generative story where you sample a cluster label from a categorical, but then you sample x from some distribution, right? It doesn't have to be a Gaussian. Uh, and then the marginal likelihood problem is the same as before, uh, where we're summing over all the training data examples and then each of the cluster possible cluster assignments where we have the prior over that probability of that cluster assignment times the likelihood of the point coming from that cluster. So this here you can look at as an expectation under P of Z of uh, the probability of X. Right. And this could be any distribution for the rest of data. So if you're doing supervised learning in this model, then the parameters decouple. And in fact, what you have is just the naive Bayes model. Right. Specifically, the way that we were looking at it, it would be Gaussian naive Bayes, right? where z is the, the label for the example, and then you have, F, uh, you have m different features. And, and so then you could separately maximize to get theta and phi. So in the unsupervised learning problem, uh, the parameters are actually coupled. You can't actually decompose. So here, this is like the, the usual supervised Bayesian network training, where we maximize over both theta and phi, but we get separate maximization problems over, oops, that's a typo, uh, over theta, and phi. Okay. So in the unsupervised learning setting, these parameters are coupled by the <coughs> summation over the z. So um, if you just write down this objective function, um, there's actually lots of ways that you could optimize it. Um, and uh, like stochastic gradient descent, for example. Um, but a really common way of optimizing it is the expectation maximization algorithm. And uh, that's, that's what we're about to talk about here, just very briefly before we move on to variational EM. Okay, 
So the first algorithm that I want to show you is HardEM. Okay, this is sometimes also called the Turby TM. And here's how it works. So you initialize your parameters randomly, and then while you've not converged, your E step sets all of your latent variables to the values that maximize likelihood, treating the parameters as fixed. Okay. Then, in what we call the M step, you set the parameters to the values that maximize likelihood, treating the latent variables as observed. Okay. So this goes back and forth, updating all the latent variables, and then all the parameters, and then all the latent variables, and then all the parameters. And, uh, and so in the E step, you're estimating the un unobserved variables, and then you're getting maximum likelihood estimates of the unobserved parameters. OK. So soft EM says almost the same thing. We're going to initialize the parameters randomly. And then while, we're not going to while we haven't converged, we're going to go back and forth between an E step and an M step. Uh, so this is this is all this is also just sort of the standard expectation maximization algorithm. So in the E step, you're going to create one training example for each of the possible values of the latent variables, and then you're going to weight each of those examples according to the model's confidence that that is the correct labeling, okay. treating the parameters as observed. And then in the M step, you set the parameters to the values that maximize likelihood. But now, we'll call these pseudo counts, these weights you could also call pseudo counts. And we'll set the parameters to the values that maximize likelihood. OK, so it's the soft version of RDM uh, because now we're waiting the likelihood of each latent variable assignment by the model's confidence in that assignment. OK, so getting a contrast here for Gaussian mixture models, in hard EM, you're actually doing an argmax over uh, the possible assignments to z and picking the most likely one. So for each training example, zi, or for each of the i training examples, you're updating zi to be the most probable value, the most probable cluster. But in soft EM, you're getting a distribution, which is this distribution CI, over all of the possible cluster assignments. And that's given by uh, this conditional probability. And then the M step, it looks kind of the same in each case. It's just that in the hard EM case, you're just counting up, say, the number of cluster assignments. Whereas in the soft EM case, uh, you're looking at real valued numbers, real valued probabilities, and weighting the counts according to those probabilities. C. Okay. okay, so once you do this, then you could, inf you could get some new training example, and you could obtain a posterior distribution over the cluster assignments for that new example if you wanted to. OK, so what I just showed you um, is actually uh, k-means and sort of. It's like a fancy k-means where we allow the k-means clusters to have a variance term. Okay. And then uh, this is just sort of the standard EM uh, for a Gaussian mixture model. OK, so let's look at an actual run of these two algorithms. So first, let's look at hard EM. So what we do is uh, we randomly initialize the cluster centers. And then, oh, hmm. Uh, let's get a PDF version of my slides. Some Windows bug won't display these properly. 
Okay. Okay, so now we can actually see the cluster centers. Uh, so there's a, a blue, a green, and a red cluster center. Okay. And what we do is we uh, reassign the cluster centers and then update all the points to be assigned to the closest cluster center. And then we do that again, and again, and again, and eventually it converges. So it converges really quickly, right? Starts here. You have a bunch of blue points that are assigned to the blue cluster center because it's the closest one. But then the cluster centers move. You reassign the points. Okay. And uh, so you can see, like, there's like these two green points right on the very edge that change from blue to green as we're going. And then there's these three red points here that, as the blue cluster moves closer to the center of the blue points, change to blue. Okay, okay. so the EM algorithm for a Gaussian mixture model is doing almost the same thing. Okay, it's going to initialize the cluster center, but it's not going to assign, assign each point to the most probable cluster. It's going to say each point there's a posterior distribution over which cluster that point came from, right? So we can graphically represent that by saying, OK, this point down in the bottom corner here is about 50% sure that it came from the red cluster. There's maybe 30% uh, you know, chance that it came from the blue cluster, and then 20% chance that it came from the green cluster. So reweighting based on those probabilities, we update our cluster centers. Okay, and you can see them going. And gradually, as the cluster centers are changing, notice that these points down in this bottom corner, because the red cluster center is moving down, are becoming more uh, red. Or the posterior distribution over the cluster centers is becoming more red. And the points in the upper left corner are becoming more green. So this continues for a while until gradually the cluster centers sort of settle in. And what we get is this lovely thing happening, which is that uh, most of the points that are really close to a cluster center are really sure that they came from that cluster. But there are these points on the boundary that are actually still representing their uncertainty about which cluster they came from. If you run the thing long enough, the, uh, it does converge. And it even con converges with some uncertainty about a few of those points that are kind of on the boundaries. OK. So OK. So. Uh, K-means tends to converge a lot faster than a Gaussian mixture model, as we saw. And each iteration of K-means is computationally less intensive. But the Gaussian mixture model is actually giving us a probability distribution over the cluster assignments, whereas K-means is not. Okay. So uh, some useful properties of this EM algorithm to keep in mind that also apply to variational EM are that EM is trying to optimize a non-convex function uh, but it's also a local optimization algorithm. So it's really just picking some initial assignment of those cluster centers and then climbing to the most likely configuration, maximizing marginal likelihood. And so the typical solution to this is you do a bunch of random restarts. Uh, and each time you initialize the parameters randomly, and then you pick the parameters that gave you the highest likelihood. So if you do a bunch of random restarts and you find, OK, these parameters corresponded to the overall highest likelihood, then those are the ones that you usually go with. Okay. So there's lots of interesting variants to this algorithm. Uh, so generalized EM uh, replaces the M step, which is just likelihood maximization, by instead doing a single gradient step to improve the likelihood. So it's not necessarily that you're going to uh, pick the most likely estimates of the parameters, but rather you're just going to change the parameters a little bit by taking a step in the direction that maximizes likelihood. 
Um, so Monte Carlo EM says, well, one way of getting those that posterior distribution over which cluster center a point came from is by doing this exact computation. But another way that you could do it is approximating it by sampling. Okay. So for Gaussian mixture models, we would never do this uh, because it's easy to actually uh, do the exact computation. But for a fancier model, like say LDA, this might actually make sense. Um, okay, so uh, there are other things like sparse EM that kind of keep uh, some active points and uh, incremental EM uh, that's kind of like uh, the online equivalent of EM, and there's other variants as well. Okay, so um, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Or well, no. So you're still, you're still taking a step in the direction of the gradient, uh, but it's uh, an, sort of an axis. So uh, we'll see in a minute that EM is really like a block coordinate ascent algorithm. And so taking a gradient step in the, in the direction of uh, that most improves the likelihood is still going to usually push you uphill. Okay, but it's possible you could actually go downhill, right? So if your gradient step was too large, right, the gradient might be pushing you in this direction, but maybe you stepped so far that you dropped into that valley. Okay, so um, some good things about EM are there's no learning rate to worry about. Um, it's very fast for low dimensions. Each iteration is guaranteed to improve the likelihood. Some problems are that it can get stuck in local minimum. Uh, uh, it could be slower than, say, gradient-based methods. Um, it might require an expensive inference step. Um, and if you don't actually care to do maximal likelihood, then uh, maybe this also isn't a good choice. Okay, so let's talk about variational EM. So variational EM, uh, in order to think it through, we're going to be uh, looking at um, an example here. And uh, our example is going to be that of unsupervised part of speech tagging. And um, so the idea here is that we're given, uh, as our data, sentences only. And uh, our goal is actually to infer uh, the POS tags for unlab these unlabeled sentences. And uh, the model that we're going to work with here uh, is actually going to be a uh, Bayesian HMM, which we'll sketch out here in a second. Um, and so uh, the Bayesian HMM is going to consist <coughs> of sort of one part that's that's kind of familiar looking, which is like a, the HMM backbone. So we're going to have words like W1, W2, W3, so on. And then we're going to have tag variables, which I'll call T1, T2, T3. And the HMM graphical model says that the word was generated uh, conditioned on just the tag, and the tag at time step t was generated <laughs> conditioned on the tag at time step t minus 1. Okay, so if we want to make this a Bayesian model, then what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, the parameters of this HMM are themselves part of the graphical model. Okay. So what that looks like is we're going to say that there's uh, 
uh, emission and transition parameters, and uh, the emission the emission parameters phi sub e are used to generate the words. So conditioned on the tag, you're going to look up the probability of each of your words using phi e. And then we're also going to have transition parameters, which we'll call phi t, and those are used to generate the tags themselves. Now, the, uh, the Bayesian would say that we also have hyperparameters, beta e and beta t, and those are the hyperparameters, say, of some Dirichlet priors over our parameters. So that is what distinguishes this, uh, this Bayesian HMM from, say, a non-Bayesian HMM, is that we actually have uh, these prior distributions over our parameters. OK, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, think about this in terms of the variational inference framework that we had been setting up. So namely, we're going to say uh, these beta parameters, those are sort of what we had been talking about as the parameters of our distribution, p alpha of uh, x and z. And then the z variables here are all of the, the phi's and all of the t's as well. And then x, well, that's just uh, the actual observations, right? like the words. Okay. So this is our actual true model. But then we also want to have a mean field approximation. And so the mean field approximation here is going to be some distribution over just the z's, right? So that's the let's say, q sub theta of z. And what this will look like is we're going to have uh, the parameters phi e and phi t. And then we're going to have uh, t1, t2, and t3 here. And they're all going to be uh, independent. But if we wanted to be uh, really specific about this, we could say, well, actually, what's going on here is there really are separate parameters that we would call, say, theta. And theta is what we uh, would condition on to get all of these other variables. And so theta here is actually observed. And so if you observe theta, then all of these other ones are independent. Right? That's, that's what the mean field approximation is saying. Conditioned on theta, the variables are independent. Okay. So, uh, so here we're saying you know, these are all the z variables. So, all right, so what do we actually use as our training objective? Well, the training objective that we're going to use is just the marginal likelihood of our data. So we're going to say uh, we want to maximize, for each training example, the log probability of x given parameters alpha. OK, so how can we do that? Well, what we can do is we can say uh, we're given sentences only. Oh, yeah, question. So in our model, <coughs> it's 
And also the arrows between phi e, uh, like the phi's and the t's and the phi's and the phi e's and the phi p's and the t's. Yeah. So those are the those are the things that we removed. And in fact, I mean, maybe it would be even clearer if we had drawn out the factor graph version of this base net, right? Because there are actually factors connecting phi e and t one, right? Like w one, t one, and phi e. They all participate in a factor, and we've removed that factor. Okay, so the trick that I'm going to play here is I'm going to say we're given sentences only, but let's say that they are concatenated uh, together into one long string. So what do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, here w1 and w2, that is sentence 1, and then w3 and so on, that is sentence 2, and then there's, you know, sentence 3, sentence 4, and so on. So basically what that allows us to do is now we're saying p of x given alpha is the probability of our entire collection of all the training sentences. Okay. And maybe we inject like end of sentence symbols or something, or periods so that you know that a sentence has come to an end. Okay, so this log p of x given alpha is just the log of a sum over all of the z's of the probability of x and z given alpha. Okay, so let's rewrite that though in terms of the variables for our actual model. For our actual model, this is a log where the, uh, we have three summations, right? A summation over the vector t over the parameters phi e and over the parameters phi t. And then the, prob the joint probability of x and z given alpha is the probability of the vector w, the vector t, phi e, phi t, given the hyperparameters beta e and beta t. So now you can see what's going on here is like, this is x, this is z, this is alpha. Right? Okay, but I wanted to make sure that we're grounded back in sort of the notation that we had set up last time. Okay, so here's why. Because now, let's think about how, how would we actually optimize this training objective? Hmm. Well, what if we used the elbow? Remember, we said that we can't directly work with this quantity. It's intractable. But the elbow provides a lower bound for it. So the log of the probability of x given alpha is a lower bound, or sorry, the log probability of x given alpha is a lower bounded by the elbow of q, right? Where elbow of q is just an expectation under q theta of, this should be familiar, the log probability under alpha of x and z <coughs> minus the expectation under q theta of log q theta of z. And we can write out that elbow for our model as well, right? It would just be, okay, so I'm just going to replace these two distributions with the, the joint and the mean field approximation. So this is expectation under Q theta of the log of P of W T phi E phi T uh, given beta e and beta t, right? So we have that as the first term. And then the second term, the expectation under q theta, is a log of q theta. And what is q theta really a distribution over? It's over uh, vector t, phi e, and phi t. Right? That's what z is, these three together. Okay. 
So here's the, here's the punchline. So our new idea here, oh, thanks. So our new idea is the following. Let's jointly find P alpha and Q theta to make uh, the elbow of Q theta as large as possible. And if we make elbow of Q as large as possible, then we should be choosing parameters that are at least giving us as tight a lower bound on the thing that we really wanted to optimize as possible. So what we're doing here is we're essentially making uh, two approximations. So the first approximation is we're doing approximate learning. Okay, why is that? Well, we're choosing alpha uh, for p, and the thing is we really uh, wanted to maximize uh, this log probability of x given alpha, but instead uh, we are maximizing a variational lower bound. That's the elbow. Okay, so that's the first approximation. The second approximation that we're making is that we're doing approximate inference. Okay. So approximate inference here means we're choosing the value of theta for q. And Essentially, what we're saying is, uh, after reaching uh, a local uh, maximum of the pair p alpha q theta, we're going to query q theta approximately. about the latent variable z. So these two approximations uh, are essentially what makes up uh, the variational EM algorithm. And uh, the variational EM algorithm is exactly the same as the standard EM algorithm, except that the E step is really just a matter of performing variational inference with the current parameters alpha. And then the M step is just choosing the parameters alpha that maximize likelihood. Okay. So yeah, let's take one more minute to write that out. So variational EM, is saying we're just going to apply uh, block coordinate ascent to the elbow. And uh, so the algorithm is going to say, while not converged, we go back and forth between two steps. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we have a variational E step in which we adjust our Q theta given our current P alpha. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, 
you just run variational inference to maximize KL of Q theta P alpha for theta only. Okay. So that's the variational E step. And then the variational M step is that we adjust P alpha given our current Q theta. So what does that look like? Well, it just means that we improve, we don't actually need to improve the whole KL divergence or the whole elbow, because only one of the two elbow terms actually involves alpha. So all we need to improve is the expectation of the log of uh, P alpha of Z and X under Q theta uh, for alpha only. And, okay, so the punchline here is that this variational E step, we can actually recover the standard EL, EM algorithm. So if P alpha is inside our Q family, then in that case, we have uh, the standard EM algorithm. And so that's what's fascinating about this, right? Um, so I think that there's something sort of broken about how we often teach EM, which is that uh, we teach EM as if it sort of lives in its own little world and it's this nice convenient algorithm, where in fact, uh, I think variational EM conceptually is something that you can actually wrap your hands around and understand. Um, because the variational E step, what we're actually doing there is just running variational inference to pick the best Q theta, given whatever our current alpha is. And then in the M step, we're just picking the best alpha parameters uh, for whatever our Q theta is at the moment. And so the fact that we can make this efficient comes from the fact that we can choose an appropriately structured Q family that makes both the E step and the M step efficient. And sometimes, if you get lucky, like in a Gaussian mixture model, uh, the true P alpha actually is in your Q family, and then you can do the E step exactly. And you don't need to rely on the approximation. OK. So next time, uh, what I'll do to wrap, wrap this thought up is just present you with a table that ties together uh, map decoding, marginal inference, uh, variational Bayes, uh, regular EM, variational EM, uh, and, and looks at how we can get kind of all of these uh, just by doing different things around summation and maximization. So we'll pick up there. Thanks for staying a little late today.